Hello. Welcome, welcome. So, continuing reading the Sutra of Hua Neng, Hui Neng, and we are on chapter seven, just a few pages in. Probably just read a few pages, hang out for a few minutes, and then get my uh, get my ass back to work. Kind of taking advantage of reading like so to keep me from uh, doing something less necessary. All right. Having heard the stanza, Fata was enlightened and moved to tears. It is quite true, he exclaimed. You know, let me read that stanza again. Because that's what I last read last time. I read, when our mind is under delusion, the Sadharma Pundarika Sutra turns us round. With an enlightened mind, we turned round the sutra instead. To recite the sutra for a considerable time without knowing its principal object indicates that you are a stranger to its meaning. The correct way to recite the sutra is without holding any arbitrary belief. Otherwise, it is wrong. He who was a Above affirmative and negative rides permanently in the white bullock cart, the vehicle of Buddha. Having heard the stanza, stanza Fata was enlightened and moved to tears. It is quite true, he exclaimed that therefore I was unable to turn round the sutra. It was rather the sutra that turned me round. He then raised another point. The sutra says, from Shravaka's disciples up to Bodhisattva's, even if they were to speculate with combined efforts they would be unable to comprehend the Buddha knowledge. But you, sir, give me to understand that if an ordinary man realizes his own mind, he is said to have attained the Buddha knowledge. I am afraid, sir, that the conception of those gifted with superior mental dispositions Others may doubt your remark. Furthermore, three kinds of carts are mentioned in the sutra, namely, carts yoked with goats, the vehicle of Shravakas, carts yoked with deers, the vehicle of Pratyeka Buddhas, and carts yoked with bullocks, the vehicle of Bodhisattvas. How are these two be, dis be distinguished from the white bullock carts? The patriarch replied, The sutra is quite plain on this point. It is you who misunderstand it. The reason why Shravakas, Pratyeka Buddhas, and Bodhisattvas cannot comprehend the Buddha knowledge is because they speculate on it. They may combine their efforts to speculate, but the more they speculate, the farther they are from the truth. It was to ordinary men, not to other Buddhas, that Gotama Buddha preached this sutra. As for those who cannot accept the doctrine he expounded, 
He let them leave the assembly. You do not seem to know that since we are already riding in the white bullock cart, there is no necessity for us to go out to look for the other three vehicles. Moreover, the sutra tells you plainly that there is only the Buddha vehicle and that there are no other vehicles, such as the second or the third. It is for the sake of this sole vehicle that Buddha has preached, had to preach to us with innum innumerable, 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 excuse me, skillful devices, using various reasons and arguments, parables and illustrations, and so on. Why can you not understand that the other three vehicles are makeshifts for the past only, while the sole vehicle, the Buddha vehicle, is the ultimate meant for the present? The Sutra teaches you to dispense with the makeshifts and to escort to the ultimate, resort to the ultimate. Having resorted to the ultimate, you will find that even the name ultimate disappears. You should appreciate that you are the sole owner of these valuables and that they are entirely subject to your disposal. When you are free from the arbitrary conception that they are the fathers or the sons or that they are at so-and-so's disposal, you may be said to have learned the right way to recite the sutra. In that case, from kalpa to kalpa, the sutra will be in your hand, and from morning to night, you will be reciting the sutra all the time. Being thus awakened, Vata praised the patriarch in a transport of great joy with the following stanza. The delusion that I have attained great merits by reciting the sutra 3,000 times over is all dispelled by an utterance of the master of Sao O Chi, the patriarch. He who has not understood the object of a Buddha's incarnation in this world is unable to suppress the wild passions accumulated in many lives. The three vehicles yoked by goat, deer, and bullock respectively are makeshifts only. While the three stages, preliminary, intermediate, and final, in which the orthodox dharma is expounded, are all set out indeed. How few appreciate that within the burning house itself, i.e. mundane existence, the king of dharma is to be found. The patriarch then told him that henceforth he might call himself a sutra reciting bhikshu. After that interview, Fatah was able to grasp the profound meaning of Buddhism. Yet he continued to recite the sutra as, above, as before. Bhikshu Chitung a native of Shaochu of Anfeng had read Lankavatara Sutra a thousand times, but he could not understand the meaning of Trikaya and the four Prajnas. Thereupon, he called on the patriarch for an interpretation. As to the three bodies, explained the patriarch, 
the pure dharmakaya is your essential nature. The perfect sambhogakaya is your wisdom. And the myriad nirmanakayas are your actions. If you deal with these three bodies apart from the essence of mind, there would be bodies without wisdom. If you realize that these three bodies have no positive essence of their own, because they are only the properties of the essence of mind, you attain the bodhi of the four prajnas. Listen to my stanza. The three bodies are inherent in our essence of mind, by development of which the four prajnas are manifested. Thus, without shutting your eyes and your ears to keep away from the external world, you may reach Buddhahood directly. Now that I have made this plain to you, believe it firmly and you will be free from delusions forever. Follow not those who seek enlightenment from without. These people talk about Bodhi all the time, but they never find it. May I know something about the four prajnas? asked Chitong. If you understand the three bodies, replied the patriarch, you should understand the four prajnas as well. So your question is unnecessary. If you deal with the four prajnas apart from the three bodies, there will be prajnas without bodies, in which case they would not be prajnas. The patriarch then uttered another stanza. The mirror-like wisdom is pure by nature. The equality wisdom frees the mind from all impediments. The all-discerning wisdom sees things intuitively without going through the process of reasoning. The all-performing wisdom has the same characteristics as the mirror-like wisdom. Get a little water here. The first five vijnanas, consciousness dependent respectively upon the five sense organs, and the alaya, alaya vijnana, storage or universal consciousness, are transmuted to prajna in the Buddha stage, while the Klishtaman no Vijnana, soiled mind consciousness or self consciousness, and the Mano Vijnana, thinking consciousness, are transmuted in the Bodhisattva stage. These so called transmutations of vijnana are only changes of appellations and not a change of substance. When you are able to free yourself entirely from attachment to sense objects at the time these so-called transmutations take place, you will forever abide in the repeatedly arising Naga Samadhi, Dragon Samadhi. Upon hearing this, Chi Tung realized suddenly the prajna of his essence of mind and submitted the following stanza to the patriarch. Intrinsically, 
The three bodies are within our essence of mind. When our mind is enlightened, the four prajnas will appear therein. When bodies and prajnas absolutely identify with each other, we shall be able to respond in accordance with their temperament and dispositions to the appeals of all beings, no matter what form they may assume. To start by seeking for the trikaya and the four prajnas is to take an entirely wrong course for being inherent in us, they are to be realized and not to be sought. To try to grasp or confine them is to, against, is to go against their intrinsic nature. Through you, sir, I am now able to grasp, uh, grasp the profundity of their meaning. And henceforth, I may discard forever their false and arbitrary names. Bhikshu Chichang, a native of Kue Chi'i of Xin Chao, joined the order in his childhood and was very zealous in his efforts to realize the essence of mind. One day he came to pay homage to the patriarch and was asked by the latter whence and why he came. I have recently been to the White Cliff Mountain in Hong Chao, he replied, to interview the master, Ta Tuong, who is good enough to teach me how to realize the essence of mind and thereby attain Buddhahood. But as I still have some doubts, I have traveled far to pay you respect. Will you kindly clear them up for me, sir? What instruction, excuse me, what instruction did he give to you? Asked the patriarch. After staying there for three months, without being given any instruction and being zealous of the Dharma, I went alone to his chamber one night and asked him, what was my essence of mind? Do you see the illimitable void, he asked? Yes, I do, I replied. Then he asked me whether the void had any particular form and when I said that the void is formless and therefore cannot have any particular form, he said, your essence of mind is like the void. To realize that nothing can be seen is right enough. To realize that nothing is knowable is true enough, is true knowledge. To realize that it is neither green nor yellow, neither long nor short, that it is pure by nature, that its quintessence is perfect and clear, is to realize the essence of mind and thereby attain Buddhahood, which is also called the Buddha knowledge. As I do not quite understand his teaching, will you please enlighten me, sir? His teaching indicates, said the patriarch, that he still retains the arbitrary concepts of views and knowledge, and this explains why he fails to make it clear to you. Listen to my stanza. To realize that nothing can be seen but to retain the concept of invisibility is like the surface of the sun obscured by passing clouds. To realize that nothing is knowable, but to retain the concept 
of unknowability may be likened to a clear sky disfigured by a lightning flash. To let these arbitrary concepts rise spontaneously in your mind indicates that you have misidentified the essence of mind and that you have not yet found a skillful means to realize it. If you realize for one moment that these arbitrary concepts are wrong, your own spiritual light will shine forth permanently. Having heard this, Chi Che Ang at once felt that his mind was enlightened. Thereupon he submitted the following stanza to the patriarch. To allow the concepts of invisibility and unknowability to rise in the mind is to seek bodhi without freeing oneself from the concepts of phenomena. He who is puffed up by the slightest impression, I am now enlightened, is no better than he was under delusion. Had I not put myself at the feet of the patriarch, I should have been bewildered without knowing the right way to go. And I think we'll take a little pause there. Still uh, on chapter seven with uh, a few more pages left. We'll let it simmer in and enjoy. Cool. Thanks. Uh, thanks for checking it out. Take it easy. See you next time.